So what we're going to do today is we'll continue on with our discussion of activities. And we should get that done today, as well as also talk about some of the example applications. I'll walk through some of the examples. I'll show you how they work and uh, walk through the code. That'll give you a really good idea of how to start to structure your assignment three project, which uh, you should be working on now because it's due a week from today, or maybe a week from tomorrow. So if you recall what we discussed last time, I talked about what activities were. Activities are usually user-facing, although they don't have to be, and you'll get a chance to play around with that in assignment number three. We also talked about the concept of lifecycle method. And lifecycle methods are basically these hook methods that are called back automatically by the Android environment when certain things happen that have to do with either creating the activity or the activity starting and stopping and resuming and pausing and all these kinds of good things are being destroyed. And these are basically hooks that you have to fill in as users of the Android activity framework in order to be able to get the application to behave properly based on what's going on in its external environment. And you'll see, get more understanding of that as we go through the examples. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start discussing how you create and start activities. So Android applications are started with intents. And there's typically a, uh, a default or a, a, an activity that's used to launch an application. That's the starting point. It's kind of like if you're uh, familiar with C or C++ or Java, you have a main method or main function where everything starts. It's called the entry point. Well, every application has an entry point activity that's used to launch it. So when people click on the icon associated with this particular application, that activity starts to run. And when someone uh, sends an intent, that is basically an indication or notification to the Android Activity Manager service, which does a lot of interesting things for applications and various components, that the user wants something or other to happen. And you can read this link for a nice description of how everything works under the hood. <clears throat> a walk through kind of a interaction diagram that illustrates some of the key points. So when a user clicks a button for an application that's part of the applications that are available either on the home screen or through the ap applications menu, that causes the launcher to make an inter-process communication call via the so-called binder framework. The binder framework is used to send uh, intents and other kinds of data back and forth between components in Android. And uh, so the launcher sends an, a call passing in the intent and also indicating what, what the intent has been passed to, starting an activity, starting a service, uh, broadcasting to a, a broadcast receiver, et cetera, et cetera. And then the activity manager service does some sanity checking, making sure that uh, it figures out who actually can handle this intent, who's registered to handle this intent for this kind of a component, and also doing some permission checking to make sure that the person who's trying to launch the application actually has permission to do so. And then finally, when it's all happy that it's found the uh, activity in this case that it wants to launch, it goes ahead and uses a start method on, on a process object, which goes ahead and creates a new process to run the application in. And that talks to something called the zygote, which is a really cool system level component. We won't go into too much detail, but if you Google Android Zygote, you'll see how it's used to launch applications. And it's designed to optimize the startup time by doing all kinds of clever low level things. And that will end up forking a new Linux process under the hood. If you recall our discussion of processes from the operating system portion of the course, that's the part where the uh, application components run, including all the Java libraries and any native code libraries that need to be part of the application. And at that point, then, the application is loaded into memory. So since it's a Java application, that'll end up loading in the bytecode that goes along with the application, kind of starting it up. It'll load in the application class and other things, as well as other stuff that's needed, like the Dalvik virtual machine, if it's using Dalvik, the looper, the activity thread, all that kind of good stuff that's needed. And at that point, then, the activity is actually started and then a couple of hook methods are called back in order to go ahead and, and kick things off. So the onCreate method is called, and the onStart method is called. And that, at that point, control passes over to the activity that's been launched as the default activity. And from there on, it's your code, or whoever wrote the application logic in onCreate, that dictates what happens next. 
So these are kind of the basic steps that take place under the hood. In order to start an activity, you have to create an intent. Um, and you can see here, typically the way this works is that there's a primary activity, which just could be the, the overall system launcher. And some secondary activity is created as a result of, causing, of calling uh, a start activity. We're going to look at a couple of examples to make all this stuff a bit more concrete. There will be two examples we'll look at. The first example we'll look at, you give it an address, and it goes ahead and brings up an activity to show you a map of that address. So in this particular case, what will happen is there's an activity that's created in this activity, and then a start activity method is called, and you'll see that some cool magic takes place to get an application to, to do mapping. So that's one application we'll look at. And if you want to take a look at the code, which we'll look at here in more detail later, just go to this GitHub, GitHub link and you can download the code and play with it. The second application, which is actually a bit more like your assignment number three, although there's significant differences in terms of the details, uh, is a little bit more interesting. So what this does is it actually starts a couple of activities. Um, once again, you can download this application from here. And we'll see in a minute when we look at this in more detail, what it's going to do is it's first going to have you, uh, it, you, it'll first, when it first runs, it'll bring up your contacts application on your phone. And from the contacts application, you can select a contact. And from the contact you select, the address of the contact will be extracted from the contact entry, entry. And then that address will go ahead and be used to map where the person resides. So that's a little bit more like your assignment number three. By the way, the, uh, the video is up for assignment number three if you want to see the a video of, that's from last week talking about how it works. OK, so those are the two different applications we're going to look at here in some detail. And in both of them, we're going to be passing intents to something that will start up another activity. But you'll see that there's a couple of different ways to do this. And you'll get experience with both of them in assignment number three. So the first way to do it, which is the easiest one, is to use a method called start activity. And start activity goes ahead and launches the appropriate, it resolves and launches the appropriate activity that corresponds to the intent. So as we'll see here in this particular case, and we'll look at this code in more detail later, but just in a nutshell, uh, this activity will go ahead and uh, create a URL that uh, in this case has the geo tag in it, and uh, it'll then use this in order to go ahead and start an activity, which will end up causing this map to be displayed. So that's, that's one way to do things. Notice that in this particular case, there is no result that's being passed back from the other activity, the secondary activity that's being started, back to the primary activity. The primary activity is being used just to start things up. It uses, it's basically used to get the, uh, the address. And then it goes ahead and starts up the other activity. The other activity maps the address. And when you're done with that, you hit the back button, and that activity disappears, and you're back to the original activity. But there's no communication that goes back. The second example, the one that's called map uh, location from contacts, will actually create a separate activity whose purpose in life is to get the address. Or actually, in this particular case, the, its purpose in life is to get back the contact that you have picked, and then that comes back to the main activity, and then that contact is used to launch another activity. So the way this works is instead of calling start activity, which doesn't return any result, instead the main application, this guy here, will call start activity for result. And start activity for result will start another activity, which will do something, and then when that activity is done, it'll return a result back to the caller. And we'll see how that works in just a second. It's way way more powerful because you can actually get results back as well as start things up. You'll see also when we look at this code, there'll be uh, a value or some code, a, a, a code, not software code, although it is software code too, um, that indicates the, the request that's being made. So in this case, it's the pick contact request. And you'll see why we need to specifically identify that with a unique number later. When you use start activity with result, you're expecting that whatever activity is started, which in this case would happen to be the contacts application, you're expecting that that contacts application, when it runs, and this is just a little tiny snippet of the Android contacts application, when this thing runs, one of the last things it'll do is it'll set 
the result of the activity to some intent that indicates the result you want passed back to the, the other activity that started this activity. So this is the secondary acti activity doing its thing, and then it's going to set the result of the secondary activity. So when the secondary activity is done, it'll return that result back to the primary activity so the primary activity can do something with that particular um, result. And then we'll also see that there's another method which you'll need to use in your code called finish. And this is used when an activity is done and should be shut down. So that means I'm stopped, don't bother sending me any more uh, lifecycle requests, I'm, I'm out of here. Now, there are different result codes that can be passed back depending on how the activity completed. So the one you want, ideally, is you want to get result OK. So result OK basically just says the activity that ran did its job, it finished correctly, it's returning a result back to the caller. That's what you'd like. But of course, that's not always what happens. Another thing you can get back is the result was canceled because people didn't have a chance to complete the operation for whatever reason. Maybe the network wasn't connected or whatever. And then you can also uh, indicate the start of user-defined result codes. And that's a more esoteric topic, but you can decide what your own result codes are if you want to do something beyond the ones that come out of the box. Okay. When the start of that, yeah. Uh, why would something be a number, not a string? Does anybody want to take a shot at answering that uh, wins question? Yes, sir. Takes less space. Takes less space, right? So uh, an integer, which is what this th thing basically is, um, is what, four bytes typically, or eight bytes, right, if you're on a 64-bit machine. If you start using strings, then people might get tempted to make them very long. So it's to make it more concise. Right. And no, it's just because people like to keep things concise when possible. Yes, sir? The, it says set result and result OK. Is that what you're expecting back? So, so you could, that? so if, if everything goes right, you can set the result OK. If something goes wrong, like if the operation can't complete for whatever reason, you wouldn't put result OK, you'd put result canceled. Okay. And that would say, I'm, you know, it wasn't OK, and it, it wasn't OK, let's put it that way. You can also return back your own user-defined codes, but if you do that, you need to add them to this value so that they will go one beyond the end of the ones that are defined by default. Okay. Yes, sir. What was the reasoning when they designed this um, behind using set results instead of just making a method that returns an intent? Well, effectively, that's what this is doing, right? So the way to think about this is when the activity is started, uh, it's off doing its own thing, and when it's about to be done, the user the, of the, act, the, the programmer of the activity, the secondary activity, it would be called here, goes ahead and, and sets the value, you know, result OK or result canceled, and then it gives an intent, right? So there's some stuff. So that, and that's sort of an open-ended amount of things you can give it back, as we'll see later on. That information is then copied into some internal data structures inside of Android that keeps track of the result of an activity. And then that result, as we'll see in a second, is then used to make a callback to the primary activity, the original one that spawned this guy in the first place, and it passes back the data as an intent, the request code, and the response code. That'll, I think that's on the next slide or two. Any questions about this whole thing, about getting the results back and so on? Okay. So here then is what happens when the result comes back. So as you can see, there's the onActivityResult method. This is a method you have to override if you so choose. If you inherit from intent, then you have the option of being able to override the on activity result hook method. And as I just mentioned, you can see it's passed a bunch of data. So it's passed the request code, which was the thing that was originally passed in, like in this case, the, the pick contact request. That would be the request code that comes back. The result code, or the response code, which is result OK, result canceled, etc. And then the data that went with the intent. So you can see, as I was just saying, the stuff that's passed to set result is the result code and then the intent. And then that information is passed back to on activity result. And then there's typically a bunch of error checking and sanity checking and so on. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Yes, ma'am. What's the difference between request code and result code? So request code is what operation it was I trying to run. So if you go back over here, you'll see that we were trying to do the pick 
contact request because we were starting up an application, an activity to, to give us an option to pick the contact we wanted from our list of contacts. The response code is whether it succeeded or failed in doing that. So request code is what operation was this and the response code is did the operation succeed or fail. So if you take a look here you can see that if the res response code was okay and if the request code was pick contact request, if those things are true, then we're going to go do a bunch of stuff and we'll look at that stuff later. Yeah, Jonathan. Are the request code numbers stat like kind of decided beforehand? You, you can decide what you want them to be. You, you are totally in control of that. So um, you just have to make sure if you, ah, so good, good question. Why does Android have request codes. What's the purpose of the request code? To get it the right application. To, the uh, activity. So it's not really used for activity. That's done through the intent. The intent uh, over here, this guy, yeah, so let's take a very specific look at this. Start activity for result. You pass the intent in, that's what's going to be used to figure out which application to run, which activity to run. Why do we have to pass in the pick contact request. Justin? Can you have multiple requests available in free? Yes, account? exactly. So, and as an application client, you, now this, this example might or might not be a good example for this, but you could, in theory, start up a bunch of other activities or other things that you wanted to have going on from the main activity, from the primary. So the primary activity could start secondary activity, a tertiary activity, etc. And when those things finish, somehow that caller, the primary activity, has to be able to differentiate which one is actually returning a result. And so that's why you give a code when you invoke it, so, and the thing will give it back to you when you're done, so you can match the two things up. So is that what the, the user-defined return ones are for? Is for providing the nuance to be able to no. say no, that's secondary, secondary activity went through, but the tertiary failed and stuff like that? Well, the, uh, no, it's not, that's not why those things are there. No. The user-defined codes are there so that you can define other kinds of things besides OK and canceled, like you might say, end of world has come, or something like that, right? The re result code is so that you, sorry, not the, rec the request code is so you can figure out which response you're getting back, because these calls are done asynchronously. So you invoke this method, you invoke start activity with result, and it doesn't block. It just goes off and does its thing, and it'll come back whenever it comes back. So if you had three or four of these things running simultaneously, you might start them up in order, you know, pick contact request, download image file, um, you know, launch torpedo, whatever things you're going to do. Or you got three things to do. You can't just treat it like a stack. Right, because you don't know the order in which they're coming back. They're, they're run asynchronously, and as they complete, when whatever order they complete, they'll come back to you. And so you have to have a way of being able to match up the request with the response. A good analogy for this, by the way, um, I don't know if you've ever sent a FedEx package or something equivalent. When you send a FedEx package, there's an air bill that you use to fill out the address. And there's also a little number that you use that's, that you can write. You can write whatever you want on this number. And so, uh, you know, it's like, let's say it's a field with 20 characters or something like that. And so when you get the receive receipt back, which might come back either physically or it might just be a computer uh, you know, screen you can go and look at, it will give you whatever you filled into that field. That's the, basically the operation field, the request operation field. It'll give you back whatever that was. So that way you can know if you sent out 13 FedEx packages to either the same person or different people, then as you start getting the results back that they either got the packages or didn't, you'll know what the package was, right? So you can match it up. So that's why those things are there, because these are all done asynchronously. By the way, what's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous? Does anybody know a good, easy definition of synchronous versus asynchronous? Yeah? Synchronous just mean at the same time. Synchronous means at the same time, mm, sort of. When? Yeah, that's, that's close, although you may be thinking more of synchronized, but like you're close. Order doesn't matter versus order matters? Uh, order doesn't matter. Those, those are all part of the thing. Synchronous typically means you invoke an operation and you block waiting for it to finish, right? Asynchronous means you invoke an operation and you don't block waiting for it to finish. 
So can anybody think of everyday life kinds of things that you do to communicate? And, and synchronous and asynchronous typically are referred to in the context of communication. That's the most typical context that occurs in. Can anybody think of an example of synchronous communication where you block? Make a phone call, right? You, you know, pick up the phone, you dial. Now, of course, nowadays with email, with uh, voicemail, it becomes asynchronous. But let's say we're back in the, the bad old days when we didn't have voicemail. So you would basically sit there waiting, you know, on the phone until it either, you know, you, you either got tired of waiting or someone picked up the phone or the call got dropped or whatever. That's synchronous communication. What's an example of asynchronous communication? Like a text message. Text message. Or a letter, you know, you mail a letter. If anybody remembers how to mail a letter, like well, who does that? But, um, you know, you put it in the mailbox. Very few people will stick a letter in the mailbox and then sit there waiting for the result to come back, right? You can have a very, very, very long wait with snail mail. So that would be asynchronous. So you can go off and do other things. Um, there are pros and cons with synchronous and asynchronous stuff. The particular discussions we're having here are asynchronous. We'll talk later about synchronous communication. Okay. So the request code is passed back, so you can figure out which request was you're handling the response for. The result code is indicated, which indicates whether it succeeded or failed. And then the intent comes back, and that carries whatever data happens to come back, which could be various things. In this particular case, it'll be an indication of which contact was picked by the, uh, by the application that's the, the people application, the contacts application. Okay. So we're going to look at some examples here shortly. But before we do that, I want to first talk about the concurrent programming aspects of all this stuff, because that, again, is, is a big discussion we'll have a lot of in this class. Is you'll get a little bit of chance to play around with concurrency. And then if you take CS282, you get a much deeper chance to play around with concurrency. So basically, the concurrency model that Android provides is constrained in various ways due to certain quirks of the way that Android works. And the way that Android works, I probably mentioned this before, but this will be another introduction to it. Android applications all have one and only one so-called UI thread or user interface thread. And these, this is the thread that actually interacts with the user. It, does, it can do other things too, but the main thing it typically does is it's the one that is called back when you add text to an edit view or you press a button or whatever, whatever you do that involves you know, type uh, characters on a keyboard, whatnot. That's the application thread. And, and, all, and certain kinds of things have to run in the application thread. All the components, activities, services, content providers, and so on, in the same process, use the same UI thread. Although we'll see later, you can, you can tweak some of these things. I should probably say by default, that's what they do. So here are some things that you can do in the UI thread. You can receive notifications either at the application level or the system level. You can interact with users, as we just described, with people clicking buttons and entering text and so on. Perform activity lifecycle operations on start, on stop, on pause, on resume, all that kind of stuff. The various components, or I guess I should say toolkit components, not quite the same thing as Android components, the various objects that exist, classes and objects that exist in the Android environment that deal with user interface related stuff all have to be accessed in the user interface thread. So if you want to set a bitmap image, that has to be done in the user interface thread. If you want to pop up a dialogue or a toast to interact and inform the user about something, all of those operations have to be done in the user interface thread. You cannot run them in background threads. If you try to run them in background threads, bad things will happen. And there's a whole variety of reasons for that. And you can read this particular link to find out sort of the rationale for why this is the way it is. Almost every user interface known to humanity uses the UI thread as a single threaded entity to do interactions with the user. Any operations, and I'm going to focus here on the activity part because that's our focus right now, but this really applies to anything. Anything that you do in the user interface thread must be so-called short duration. And short duration has a very specific meaning in Android. It's sort of between th at less than three to five seconds. That's short duration. So you know, displaying an image that you've already downloaded, um, you know, getting text from the user, all that kind of stuff, those are all examples of short duration operations. If the thing that runs on the user interface thread runs for longer than that amount of time, you get this application not responding dialog that says, do you want to shut the application down, yes or no? 
And that's because Android assumes if you're taking a long time to do something that there's probably a bug. Your code has gone into an infinite loop or it's blocked on a resource that it may not get and so on and so forth. And you can learn more about application not responding uh, patterns and programming here at this article. Conversely, long duration operations, and those are the ones that run for more than three to five seconds, those need to run in a background thread. And we'll talk a lot more about how to do that. You'll get a chance to play around with this for assignment number three. But the bottom line is things that t take a long time or a variable amount of time to run, sometimes short, sometimes long. If anything you know is going to take a potentially long time to run, that needs to run in a background thread. So downloading a file would be an example of something that really needs to run in the background thread. Um, downloading an image, downloading a music uh, file, all those kinds of things are examples of long, potentially long-running things. So, uh, synchronizing your, your uh, contacts list with your server that keeps track of contacts, because you might have multiple devices and you have to sync those things up. Those are examples of things that may take a long time to run. Obviously, you know, streaming video, uh, uploading a large file, those are all examples of things that may take a while to run. And we'll see later that these background threads can run in either Android activities or services, e either one. We'll talk more about that. The two common approaches, which we, we talked about earlier, you can find videos. If you go to the assignment number three and you look at the index.html file, you'll see that there's a bunch of links to videos that talk more about this. We will talk about this, of course, but if you want a, a head start, you can read those, uh, you can watch those videos. The Android Hammer and Async Task Frameworks are the common ways of handling concurrency in Android. The Hammer framework requires you to know a little bit about Java threading, not a lot, just a little bit. The Android async task framework requires you to know nothing whatsoever about Java threading unless you choose to know something about it. Okay, so let's, now that we've kind of covered the overall view, let's take a look at the application itself. So the first application we're going to look at is the simple one. Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, so, so there are lots of different ways to do this, right? One thing you might do if you have long-running computations, and Angry Birds might not be long enough running, but let's say you had some kind of really sophisticated 3D rendering engine or something like that, you would probably do that processing off the main thread in a background thread. And after the buffer was, was rendered, you would then do various things. There are probably actually accelerators that make this even faster. But one thing you could do is take the image, buffer, and you could say, you know, run on UI thread, and then that would take the result and it would display that. So anything that involved just sort of flinging processed bits to the display or the, the audio output, those are all things that can be done in the UI thread. The processing and computation to get it to a point where you can fling it to the surface, that is most likely to be done in the background thread. And sometimes you spawn those background threads. Sometimes, as we'll see later, when we, if we get this far today, or if not on Wednesday, uh, when we talk about services, you'll see that some Android components provide really cool hook methods that allow asynchronous computation to take place in the background with results coming back to the foreground without you having to do any of the programming yourself. So sometimes it does it. Sometimes you have to do it. But uh, the long and the short of it is that long running stuff needs to go in the background. And you know, sometimes there are trade-offs. It's not always clear something will be long running. Typically, anything that involves network communication should be prepared to be long running because you never know how slow your network might be. Okay, so here's the map location activity. Here's the map location application, and it has an activity called map location activity that maps a location from the address of a contact. So let's go ahead and run this example. Let's hopefully, it'll still be running. You never know with this stuff. Okay, so let's see if I can make this come up properly. Uh, hold on. All right. So you can enter in your, the address of whatever you're trying to do. I never can remember exactly what the address is, but this is probably pretty close to it. So if you happen to live here, so that'll go ahead and bring up a familiar site if you've ever been to DC. That's the White House. And the cool part about this when we look at the code, I didn't write that Maps application, obviously. Uh, that was done by somebody else, at, probably at Google or whoever they bought it from. And so I did write the application, however, that drove this thing, the one that prompted me for the address. 
And uh, then I got the address, and once I had that, I went ahead and started an activity that would run the Maps application. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about. We'll, we'll kind of talk through this one thing at a time. So there's a bunch of methods that are part of this application, and I'll, I'll kind of go through them at a high level first, and then we'll look at the code. So if you recall, when someone starts an, ap an application, starts an activity, the onCreate method gets called by, by the initial uh, entry point into the, into the activity or into the application. And that is typically used to do various kinds of initial, initialization. And it's only called once uh, per activity until the activity is destroyed. Then there's a method called onStart. And you can see here, this just this kind of visualizes what's going on. So we went over here and we click on you know, map a location or whatever this application is called. Right? We click on that. That causes the onCreate method to be called. And then the application begins to get ready to start. Oops. And on start gets called. And that's typically used to initialize some things that are at that level of, of uh, granularity. And then just before the application becomes capable of interacting with the user, the on resume method gets called. Now, sometimes there's not much to do. In fact, if you look at this application, you'll see there isn't anything going on in these methods. Sometimes there is, and we'll take a look at different examples later that show where they get used. So after onResume returns, now the application is capable of interacting with the user. Now, the interesting thing here is once, once you're in the onResume state, right, um, at that point, you can start to, to enter text or whatever you're doing to communicate your desires, pushing buttons or whatnot. In this particular case, we're entering text. So what I would do is I would click my finger on the edit text window up there, which would, of course, be blank initially. And I would start to type things in. At that point, what's going on is there's basically a keystroke engine deep in the bowels of Android that's recording my keystrokes. And there are no lifecycle activities generated while that's going on. So lifecycle activities are a little bit coarser grain, but typing things into a, a text window or edit text window is not generating events, nor is it changing the focus of the user interface. We're right there. We're entering the data. When I'm all done, once I've got my data entered, then I can go ahead and click the Show Map button. And of course, there's a variety of different ways to do this, but that's a typical way to do it. So I click Show Map. And that, of course, will then end up calling through the wiring mechanism I used under the hood of all this it'll end up going and calling my show map method. Now, I don't, I don't have to call it show map. I could have called it, you know, locate address or something like that. It doesn't matter. I, it's just a configuration option to map that button to whatever method I want it to be mapped to. And then various magic will take place there. And we'll look at that magic later. Now, what's going to happen in the magic here is we're going to figure out how to make the right kind of intent to launch something that will show the map. And we'll see later, there's a couple different ways to do it. But in either case, we start the activity. And this new activity that gets started here will display a map at a particular address. So now, here's the interesting thing. So a new activity is starting up, right? And that activity is going to end up displaying the map. What happens to the old activity? So once that new activity is beginning to start, then lifecycle methods will be call, called back on the original activity, the one that launched this guy in the first place. So the first method that will be called is called on pause, And that will indicate that the originating activity, or the primary activity, is about to lose focus, and the new activity is gaining the focus. So thinking back to the task stack discussion we had last time uh, with the back stack, the new activity will be pushed on top of the stack, and the old activity will be pinned underneath that. By the way, if you want to have fun, uh, if you have an Android phone, you can play around with the back stack. It's really kind of interesting. After last class, I went and played around with it for a while. And you really get a sense of how it works and what happens when you hit the home button. And it doesn't destroy the stack. It just basically um, gives you a new context where you're doing stuff. And as you move around to the task manager, you can go ahead and go back through various levels of activities on the stack. So after on pause is getting called, um, th these things are all called automatically. So, so on pause is being called, called back in the originating activity, but in the new activity, which is the one that does the mapping, then the on create and on start 
and on resume methods are all called automatically in that new activity. So things are going back and forth, back and forth. Kevin? Um, well, it shouldn't really matter, but the on pause activity and originating activity should get called before the new activity is actually up and running. But it, it shouldn't really matter because the new activity that started is going to block the old one anyway. So it's, it's gone away. I mean, it's, it's not gone away. It's, it's no longer accessible. The focus has changed to the new activity. Keep in mind also that Android, by and large, does not have overlapping windows. So when you start a new activity, it typically takes up everything and blocks the one that's already there. There, there are ways to bring up partial windows, but that's not the norm. When you start an activity, it typically jumps and you know, takes over. Um, conversely, if you were in a more conventional desktop environment, you, know, you could have a new window and it would be occluding just a portion of the other one. And it's much more complicated in that case to figure out how to move and navigate through the window hierarchy. But in Android, it's pretty simple because whichever activity is in the front is the one that has the focus, and that's the one that's going to be running. And the other ones are, are typically blocked, if they so choose to be blocked when their hook methods are called. And you can, you can find out some interesting discussions about um, how on pause is called back and why there's on pause versus on start. A lot of this stuff is somewhat murky until you really know a lot more about Android and you do stuff with graphics and uh, windows that partially block other windows and so on. And then the on stop method is called when the activity is no longer visible to the user. So when the new activity is actually now taken over the screen, you can no longer see the old activity, on stop gets called back. And the reason for this is that there's some ways of creating activities that only uh, show up in a portion of the screen. And you might want the background to continue to exist. Maybe you're doing some kind of cool graphic uh, visualization. You want that to keep going. And that'll keep going until on stop gets called. Then there's another weird method called on restart, which is called if an activity is stopped and is about to start again, which is kind of a strange thing to have, but um, they have it. And you can learn more about that. And then finally, on destroy. On destroy is called when the activity is about to shut down. And there's a variety of ways that an activity shuts down. One way an activity is shut down, in fact, the most common way is when someone navigates out of it by using the back button. But there are other ways of doing it, for example, which you'll do in your assignment number three, where you actually call finish, which is a method that tells the activity, I am done, shut me down at this point. And you'll see why you need to have that later. Okay, so now that we've talked about that, let's go ahead and look at the, um, look at the actual code. So I want to take a look at the code here. So we'll go find this thing. Probably need to make the screen ever so a bit bigger because it's kind of hard to see. Let's see, it's a big room, so we'll go with 20. All right, map location. So a couple things. Here's the Android manifest file for this thing, which um, allows you to read the contacts, because you're going to read contacts. Wants to use Android version 18. Oh, by the way, make sure that when you install your Android SDK that you at least put in SDK 18. And uh, there's a thing called the SDK Manager where you, you can download all kinds of SDKs. Uh, you're welcome to download anything else you want. They do take up disk space. But at least make sure you have 18 because that one we know works for what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> as I told you before, there's some weird changes in Android from later versions that do strange things. So we're not going to use those versions until we are sure we know how to make it work properly. Here's the act. The activity, which has a name, which we'll see how we read that. And um, this is implemented by the map location activity. And that guy is what gets called back when somebody clicks on the icon that's associated with this activity. It's the, it's the one that knows how to handle the action main, which is used when you launch an activity. So that's the manifest file. We'll learn a lot more about manifest files as we go along. Here's the actual code. As you can see, it's fairly concise. Map location activity is an activity. It extends activity. It uh, has a debugging tag that it uses for logging. It has something called an edit text. The edit text is basically the thing that corresponds to 
this. That's where we can type in the address. That's edit text. That's the edit text window. That's the object that corresponds to that, where the text will be available. Here is the onCreate hook method. Remember, this is called back when the activity is launched. It goes ahead and does some magic to call up the, t the chain. And it sets the content view to indicate how it wants the display to look. As you can see here, this is what it looks like. Here is the actual XML code that does this. So it may be hard to believe, I know, but this is the code that um, this code here is what creates this GUI there. And you can see it has a text view where it says enter location. And it has a, an edit text, which is where you go ahead and put the text. And then it has a button, which is the button that says show map. Here's the text that it uses. And here's the method it's going to call back when you click on that button. And there's a little cool Java reflection going on here. We won't talk about that in detail, but that's being used under the hood to associate these things. Yeah, Jonathan. Are we writing our own? No, those are provided for you. Okay. Yeah. And then also in the edit text, uh -huh. I don't see anything that has that information from the last thing you showed where you had the private variable of the edit text. How do you link? Oh, let's see. Um, you mean, oh, there, there is nothing, well, there is nothing in here to start with. It's just blank. How, how do you link the edit text with the show map button? Oh, I'll show you. We're about to get to there. All right, so let's kill those guys. So, so this is, what we're doing there is we're saying that's the layout we want to use. And then we go ahead, and this is getting to your question. It's not quite the answer, but it's getting there. We go ahead and we find the button that's the show map button. And we, or sorry, this is not the button. This is the text. This is the edit text. And we stash this thing away in a variable because we're going to need to use it later. So that this thing here, m adder text, we go ahead and associate that with an object. And then you'll see in a second how we use that object. OK, so assuming that the users come along and, and followed the right protocol, in other words, they've, they've entered in the appropriate location, when we click the Show Map button, and by the way, there, there are various things we could be doing here to make this work in a little bit easier way. But um, here's the, here are some of those hook methods that we talked about on Start. We just log the fact that the activity is about to become visible on Resume, log something on Pause, on Stop, on Restart, on Destroy. As you can see here, they're not doing anything interesting. They're just there so you can see the steps that are taking place when we run the application. Finally, here is show map. This is the method that does the real work. This is the method that's called back when the person clicks the show map button. That ends up using Java reflection to call the show map method with the view information. And here is the answer to your question. So now that they've clicked the button, we then go ahead and go to the M adder text object, get the text, and then we turn it into a string. Is it not already a string? It's in some other encoding that we need to be able to use as a string. So we turn it into a string. We then go through and we replace plus, uh, we replace spaces with the plus sign, which is what Google Maps wants to use to indicate things. It's just a funny thing. So you replace spaces with plus signs. We hide the keyboard, so the keyboard goes away. And now we're going to go ahead and see how we're going to get this thing launched. Now, there's a couple of different ways to launch something to view your application. And one way to do it is to uh, try to see if there's a, a Maps application. Some, some phones come with a Maps application that's built in. And the Maps application knows how to handle so-called geo intents. And we'll take a look at those in a second. So, the first thing we do is we call something called a factory method. We'll look at the implementation in a second. And it's going to go ahead and try to create an intent that's a geo intent. And you'll see what that means in just a moment. And then we, do, we go and we say, hey, if there's actually an application registered in Android that knows how to handle geo intents, we go and use this thing called resolve activity with the packet manager. If there is, in fact, an application that knows how to handle intents, start the activity and use that application to handle the intent. 
And that would be if your phone has the Maps application configured. But not all Android devices have the Maps application. Now, I'll pretty much guarantee you that your Android phone does if you have a phone. But if you have an emulator and you haven't installed the application that will view Maps, then there won't be an application to handle the geo intent. So in that case, we're going to go ahead and make a Maps intent as opposed to a geo intent, and we're going to start that. And that's going to use the browser. And you'll have a browser, right? So you always have a browser. And that'll just bring up the Google Maps um, website, and it'll give it the link that has the address, and it'll just display it in a browser as opposed to a, as a native app. Yeah? What's the final credit for? Is there a reason that you have to? Um, it's just, in this particular case, it's not strictly necessary. It's a good habit if you create local objects or um, data or fields or parameters to methods that will not change after they're initialized, it's a good habit to get into to make them final. And there's certain optimizations that can be done with respect to that. But it's also just an indicator to the reader that this thing is not going to be changed after it's set. Yeah? What if there are multiple activities that take the geo If there are multiple activities, well, I, th I think the real, yeah, if there are multiple activities that can handle the geo intent, actually a, a better, better way to ask the question is, are there multiple activities that can handle the browser intent? The, the, the URL, the answer is yes. The geo intent is pretty much just if you have maps activity, a maps application. But there might be more than one, because there might be the one that's built into Android, and there might be some cool one that you wrote or somebody else wrote as a third party app. Then if Android comes back with multiple matches when it does intent resolution, it'll then throw up a little menu, uh, a chooser menu, and you can pick which one you want to use. And you'll actually see some examples of that in later examples that we run. Android hands, handles it for you. It'll throw up that little chooser dialog, and then you select the one you want, and then you typically get a choice between always and just once. And then if you say always, it records it. If you say just once, it just runs it one time. Next time, it'll prompt again. Yeah? Is that make maps intent method? Is that the you wrote? Yeah, we'll, we'll look at that in a second. Ah, what's a great question. So the question is, what's the benefit of having implicit intents versus explicit intents? Before I answer that question first, just refresh whatever we mean. So what does it mean to have an explicit intent? What would that be? What would be an example of that? When? It calls the, it specifies the activity. It's, it's it gives the name of the activity it wants to use, or the class that implements the activity. Right. So that's explicit intent. What's an implicit intent? So it's one where you just say, I want something that can view an image, or I want something that will play music, right? You don't say, I want this application. You say, I want, I want this kind of operation to be done, or this kind of action to be done on my behalf. So the question is, why do we have implicit intents? The answer to that question is actually wrapped up in the question you just asked, but does anybody want to take a shot, shot at answering it? Exactly. So using implicit intents, allow, the fancy way of saying what you just said is it allows Android to provide late binding between applications that can handle intents and the intents themselves. So it, it allows the decisions about what to get used to be done very late, i.e. when you run the intent. So when you double click, you know, either you write the code or you double click something or whatever you do to get something to start, Android then and at that point can go take a look at all the activities and all the applications that have been configured in the system and it will come back with a list of candidates and then uh, you know, there are various ways it can disambiguate things. You can prioritize that stuff so you can say always choose this one instead of that one and then it'll just choose that one. Um, but you could override those priorities later in the life cycle of your phone or you can actually disambiguate yourself. So it gives you a lot more flexibility. It gives you the user and the system more flexibility in s matching the intent with whatever component is going to be used to implement that intent. So as a general rule, late binding gives you more freedom, more flexibility. Let's take a look at these factory methods. That'll help explain a lot of this stuff. Here's hide keyboard, just hides the keyboard. Here's geo intent. So we'll compare geo intent and maps intent. So geo intent, as you can see, goes ahead and creates a new intent. And both of these intents have the action view action. 
So they have the view action, which makes sense, right? We're trying to view an address. So what we're saying here is make me an intent that will allow Android to pick the appropriate way to view this thing. That's what we're saying with view. And then we give it some data. And in this case, the data is basically the so-called geo intent. So geo is a special tag. It basically is the, um, I think it's the content authority or something like that. It's a fancy name. And that says, you know, who will handle the geo intent? And, and if there is a geo intent handler out there configured into your system at that point, then here's the address that I want to be mapped. So that's what that's saying. So that's giving data that will be picked up by the system to figure out how to map this item. Conversely, if you don't have a, a Maps application installed on your phone, here's another way to do this. This time, we're going to basically just create a URL, and we're going to give it the maps.google.com address, and then we're going to give it the address after the question mark uh, Q equals thing, and that's just HTML gobbledygook that indicates how you want to have the receiver parse this stuff and figure out what to do with it. Yes, ma'am? Can you re-explain what intent.action is? Yeah, so if you recall, uh, when we talked about intents, we talked about there were ways of being able to do lots of different kinds of things. Let me go show you the particular discussion we had about that because it is relevant here. Whoops, that's not intents, that's services. Let's see. There we go. So we talked about um, intents being a way to indicate what you want done without having to say specifically what it is you want. So this is, these are some good examples, but I think there's also one that has more specific examples. Oh, maybe it was else, elsewhere. Well, this is good enough. So if you take a look here, here was a list of a bunch of different kinds of things that um, you might want to be able to do. So the intents would be like action view, which is saying, find me some way to view this thing. The thing might be uh, an image or it might be text or something like that. You might also say action edit. So if you want to be able to edit an email, uh, you want to be able to use the edit action. You might have action pick, which is what you would use if you wanted to come up with some way of being able to uh, choose, say, a list from your contacts application. You could have action play if you wanted to play a song, right? These are all generic things that you want to have done. They're actions. And Android defines a bunch of predefined actions, like action view, as part of the intents class. And you can also come along and define your own. We'll see some examples later of how we define our own. So that's what action view is. Action view is a statement of an operation and your intent is basically saying, because it's an implicit intent, it's saying, anybody out there know how to view this thing? And there will be, of course, things that know how to view them. So, so keeping that in mind, keeping the idea of picking and choosing these things in mind, let's take a look real quick here. So here's, say, we'll use this one, action view. And then let's kind of pop over real quick, and I will show you where that thing is actually implemented, just for fun. I'll make the font a little bigger here in a second so you can actually see it. Let's go ahead and make the appearance font 18. So if we were to go into the browser and we were to open up the Android manifest file, we're now looking at the Android implementation of the browser application. And, or, or one, there could actually be multiple browser applications running on your phone. So here's one of them. Um, and so if we take a look here, let's take a look at view. So there you go. So this is the browser application, right? So application browser. Here's the browser activity, right? And then down here, here is the intent filter for action view. And so what this is saying, this is saying, if somebody creates an intent that has the view uh, action and they have data that is the HTTP scheme, then I know how to handle that. That's what that particular intent filter is saying. It's saying if somebody does what we just did, action view, and then you give a URL, 
It says, I'm the one that knows how to handle that. Now, there actually may be other ones that know how to handle it too, but at least that one will know how to handle it. Yeah? The first one, the geo intent was a No, it was a geo. So, so this, thing, this thing probably doesn't know how to handle geo. Geo intent would be done by a native maps application, right? So if you had Google Maps, you know, the native application, that would know how to handle geo. The stuff we just looked at here knows how to handle uh, HTTP stuff. And as you can see, when we go back and look over at this code, um, the maps intent just has action view with a URL. And so we've just saw how that gets to find out that it's, it knows ha how to handle it. Um, so in this particular application, I think all things being equal, you'd probably prefer to use the maps application because it's going to be a little cooler than the maps browser. But if you didn't have a phone that had a Maps application, you'd probably be happy with the browser, right? So that's kind of the, the thinking. So that's why we do it in the order we do. We first try to do the, the geo intent. We check to see if that's configured into the system. If it is, we use that one. Otherwise, we fall back and use the, the one that's the, the browser one. OK, any questions about that? So that's, basi that's basically it, right? That's, that's basically the entire application. And so what's cool about this is that we're able to write a little bit of code that uses Android activities, and then we can do something much more powerful. We can view the address we type in on a map. But that code wasn't code we had to write. And you'll notice how loosely coupled our implementation is. We're not saying, go run this particular application and this particular activity. All we're saying is, here's an intent that wants to view this street address Android, you figure out how to make it viewable. I don't care how you do it. I just want to see it, right? So that gives you late binding. It gives you very powerful features. All right, what I want to do next, and this will probably take us up to the end, is I want to go back over here, and we're going to talk about the next example. And this is the example that is actually the one closest to what assignment number three is. So here's basically what it does. So in this case, you get a screen. You click Find Address. And, oh, and you can find the, you can find the code here. Um, you say, find address. That will create a new activity that starts up the contacts application, sometimes called the people application on different phones. It's your contacts application, from which you can then select people. So you can do whatever you need to do to get your contacts. And then when you decide a contact you like, you, you click that contact, and then that application returns back to the originating activity, something that indicates the contact that was selected. We'll talk more about that in a second. Once we have that information, we parse the contact that was selected. And it's a little bit low level, but I'll show it briefly. We come up with an intent that has the address of the contact, assuming it had a, an address. And then we go ahead and we launch the application to, to actually display that. So you can see this is more powerful than the last because in the last one, the first application, the map locations ap application, we had to type in the address. But that's tedious, right? So what you'd rather do is choose from a list of contacts, and then it'll go ahead and automatically figure out the address. Obviously, that's not my real address. So the life cycle events are the same, so I'm not going to go through them, but we have an additional activity launched here. So first, let's see if we can actually run this thing. Uh, let's see, we need to have Android, and we'll go to map location from contacts. Hopefully it works. Launching a new emulator, and hopefully in a second that'll switch over to the new one. And let's see. Yep. Every once in a while, the, uh, the emulator in Android gets confused, especially if you switch between applications. And so it'll do things like lose the old emulator, and it starts up a new one, and you have to wait a few seconds for it to start up, which is kind of annoying. Um, yeah? Uh, do you have to like, download an emulator, or can we use our phones? Like, you You're welcome to use your phones, yeah. Um, the one thing to remember about using your phones is that sometimes the phones have additional stuff configured on them that your emulator might not. And so the only issue there is if you do something really weird, 
then maybe the person who's trying to grade your program won't have your phone, right? I don't think that'll be a problem for this particular thing, but um, no, it's, it's being persnickety. So you'll just have to take, take my word for it. Um, we'll kind of see how it works by looking at the code in a second. So here are some of the key methods in this thing. Find address, which is what is called back when the user clicks on this thing. Uh, on activity result, which is called after the user has selected their activity and you get a result back. And uh, under the hood, this is going to use the hammer framework to avoid blocking the UI thread. We'll look at that in more detail in a second. We have a very convoluted method of which I will just show you a little bit. You're welcome to look at it at your leisure, but it's just a lot of low level stuff that extracts the street address from the contact that you picked. And then there's the make geo intent factor method and the make maps intent factor method. Those are basically the same as before. So in our remaining time, let's go take a quick look at the source code for all this stuff. It's really cool. And what's neat about it is you can do very powerful set of things without having to write a lot of extra code. So here's the manifest file. As you can see, it's very similar to what we had before. Uh, in this particular case, we're using a different SDK version because we're not trying to write anything, but it doesn't really matter. This works pretty much the same everywhere. Once again, we have to read the contacts. Here's the source code itself. Whoops. So we have map location from contacts activity, which is an activity. It has this pick contact request int, which we're going to use to keep track of which request matches up with which response. Here's the onCreate method. The onCreate method simply goes ahead and sets the content view, which is just going to have the find address button. That's all it does. There's nothing much going on there. Then there's a bunch of hook methods for starting and stopping lifecycle stuff. We're not going to talk about that. That's the same as before. And then here, finally, is the method that's called back when you click the find address button. So when you click the find address button, and this goes back to the earlier question you asked about what are these intents, we're going to make an intent here that's a pick intent. And we give it the content um, authority, as it were, of and the content URI of the contacts application, which is actually a, done as a provider. It's a, something that's done under the hood that does a lot of really cool stuff. And so what this is going to do is this is going to start up an activity which will run the contacts application. And that's how we indicate that. We say, I want to pick something. So that's, that's just a generic intent. You're picking, in this case, a contact. So you say, I want to pick something. And then you indicate where do you want to pick it from. And you want to pick it from this particular content URI, which will ultimately find its way into the thing that runs the Android contacts application. And then we go ahead and say start activity for result, passing in the intent and also packing in the pick contact request value. And that is going to be used in a minute when we get the result back. So when we call this, when we make this call, then the contacts application pops up. We can search and select the appropriate user as we see fit. And that we didn't write that code. That's very low level gobbledygook code that Android provides. I can show you a bit of it if you're curious. And then when that's done, it'll send a result back that comes back through on activity result. So just for kicks, let's go take a look over here just to prove to you there is such a thing. Go take it. This is the contact application. Here's the Android manifest file. So you can see here, um, this is the pick intent. So this, this guy is basically saying, call back the contact selection activity, call that activity, when the pick action is given with any of this kind of data. So that you can have a contact, a person, there's all kinds of stuff you can put in here. Um, and under the hood, that'll end up calling back to Con oh, that's under activities, I think. That'll end up calling back to this method here, contact selection activity. This is actually the activity that'll get called. So I'm not gonna, certainly not going to walk through this in gory detail, but if you want to search for set result, you can see that this is how the result gets sent back. So maybe it's canceled, maybe it's OK. Um, so if the person successfully picked the right application or the right contact, that'll get sent back to the caller of this thing. 
And the caller of this thing is going to handle it through an on activity result hook method, which comes in here and says, did it succeed? Did we get a result OK? And was it, in fact, the pick contacts request? Is that why this thing's being called back? For this particular application, there's only one request. So it's always going to be the right one. But more generally, you could have multiple outstanding requests on the same or different activities. And now we're going to do something really cool. Now we're going to go ahead and do some magic to get the rest of this code to run in the background. And you'll see in a second why we want it to run in the background thread, because it's somewhat complicated. So we make ourselves a runnable. And this runnable has a rather verbose name. It's called get and display address from contact. It's rather verbose, but at least it's descriptive. You know what it's trying to do. And so it has a run method. Now, this run method is going to do two things. The first thing this run method is going to do is it's going to call another helper method, which we'll look at in a second, called get address from contact. And it's going to take what was passed back to this activity from the contacts application. In this particular case, it's going to get back a URI, which is just like a, a path name, to a row in the contacts database that corresponds to the person you selected as wanting to be your contact. So you click on that person, and you get back a URI, or a, a path name, if you will, to that row in that database. We don't get back the contact. You get back a way to get the contact. It's like asking someone for help, and they give you a phone number to call. right? They don't give you the information. They give you a phone number, or they give you a URL. So we get that address. Now keep in mind, this thing is going to be running in a background thread. And then after we have extracted the address, and you'll see why we have to do this in the background thread in a second, we then go ahead and take the, um, this thing and we put it on the user interface thread. So what's going to happen here is in the user interface thread, we're then going to go ahead and make the geo intent or make the browser intent, either one, make the map intent. That's going to be run back in the user thread. And we, we're using this with this fancy method called run on UI thread. And if you watch those videos about the Android Hammer framework, you'll see how all this stuff works. This code here is pretty much the same thing we had in the other application. Down here, keep in mind, this is at the end of this method. This is the end of on activity result. We create a new thread, passing in this rather verbose get and display address from contact runnable as the entry point to the thread, and we start that thread. So that thread will go and run, and it will go ahead and get the address from the contact, and then it'll go ahead and take that address, and it'll put that back into a message and pass it back to the user interface thread where it gets run. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later next time. Here's this got awful long method called get address from contact. This goes out. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but this is what goes out, finds the contact that corresponds to your selection in the contacts application, and then opens this thing up and does an SQL query in order to be able to get back that contact. And once we've got the contact, we then extract their street, their city, their state, their postal code, et cetera. And we stick this into a string, and we return the string. Don't worry too much about this code. It's, it's stuff we'll cover later, but it's not important for the moment. So, and th these methods are the same as before. So the cool part about this, and this is, this is really now you have pretty much everything you need for assignment number three, because um, this is similar, although not identical to what you'll be doing. Um, we have a way of being able to use an activity to launch another activity which does something on our behalf, which in this case is pick a contact. That gets passed back to the originating activity. We use the information that came back from the original, for the secondary activity, to find out the information we need to make an address. And then we use that information to create an intent to start a way to view the map. So it seems like a lot of steps, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And it's way, way simpler than if you had to write all this code yourself, right? Write the map application yourself, write the contacts application yourself, your mind would explode, right? So we're basically gluing those pieces together. So this is a very important theme we'll talk a lot about in the course about composition, component, resolution, um, command patterns, all this kind of good stuff.